Thank you for joining us for Clinical Grand Rounds. This is the first one we've had since 2015. So here we are, it's been some time. So let us begin with a prayer from an author, Joyce Rupp. May you desire to be healed. May what is wounded in your life be restored to good health. May you be receptive to the ways in which healing needs to happen. May you take good care of yourself. May you extend compassion to all that hurts within your body, mind, and spirit. May you be patient with the time it takes to heal. May you be aware of the wonders of your body, mind, and spirit and their ability in returning you to good health. May you be open to receive from those who extend kindness care, and compassion to you. May you rest peacefully under the sheltering wings of divine love, trusting in this gracious presence. May you find little moments of beauty and joy to sustain you. May you keep hope in your heart. Amen. We have a most excellent presentation lined up for you today with facilitator Dr. Scott Eilers, who's a board certified clinical psychologist and psychotherapist with Mercy Family Counseling. He's also the author of the book, For When Everything is Burning. Highly recommend this read. It is personal, it is raw, and it is beautiful. At the end of Dr. Eilers' presentation today, you are most welcome to ask questions. I do have this lovely microphone and that's not to embarrass you. That's so all of our people online can hear you. And for those of you who are online, please submit your questions to the chat feature. Just a reminder, if you're a physician seeking CME credit or other healthcare provider interested in continuing medical education for today's presentation, please stop by and just chat with me after today, or you can send me an email if you're online for further details. I'll also put this information in the chat once we get started. Without further delay, I introduce Dr. Scott Eilers and his presentation on aggressive self-care. Welcome, Scott. audio quality reasons. Let me make sure I understand how this works. It appears that I do not. Is this a touch screen? It is not a touch screen. It's just underneath the little desk with the mouse that you get. Oh, yeah. it's not the oh, clicker. Got it. Let's go. OK. All right. So that pretty much could not have been a more on point prayer, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, before I get started, I just briefly have a disclosure to make, and I guess you all probably figured this out by now, but I wrote a book, and I was not 100% sure if a self-help book is considered um, a healthcare good or not. I figured better safe than sorry, so um, I have written a book. This is not explicitly a promotion for the book or anything along those lines, but I may mention it from time to time because it may be relevant to what I'm talking about, such as right now. So. Let's start with an easy question. What is the most important thing in your life? And don't think too hard about it. Don't try to think about the right answer or what it should be. Just whatever the first thing that comes into your mind, consider that functionally to be your answer because chances are that that's how you're actually living. Whatever the first thing that popped in, maybe it was family, career, faith, values. Maybe it was something I don't have on my list. Whatever your first thought was, that's probably how you're arranging your life and spending your time and spending your energy. Um, just whatever that was, keep it in mind and we're gonna kind of go back to it. I have a proposal about what that thing should be. And I recognize that the title of my presentation might be a little bit of a spoiler as to what that is. But I want you to think about where you would rank something that is with you every second of every day, 
something that every experience you ever have gets filtered through, something that affects your energy, your motivation, your ability to engage with others, your relationships with other people, your ability to connect with any kind of spiritual beliefs or higher power that you have, um, and something that basically controls whether or not you enjoy your life. Because I think there is something that although it may not seem objectively more important than any of the examples that were on the previous slide, I do believe there is something that is more fundamental to the quality of your life than any of those things. And that thing is you. So I'm curious, when I said, what is the most important thing in your life? Did anybody, and you can just raise your hands, did anybody think myself, it's me? That's usually, oh, one person did? Did you raise your hand? I am very happy that one person did. That does not usually happen, and I find that very encouraging. This is technically just my opinion, but I don't think that there is anything more important in each of our lives individually than ourselves. And, and I guess it kind of depends on how you define importance, because I know you may not feel that you're more important than other people or more important than the things you do. And I'm not trying to convince you that you are. But if you do not take good care of yourself, what do you think will happen to all those other things? What do you think will happen to those responsibilities you have and your ability to carry them out every day? What do you think will happen to the people who depend on you and the people who need you in your personal life, in your professional life, in every endeavor that you have? We have a tendency to treat ourselves as infinite resources, that, that we don't need anything. And, and we can just give and give and give uh, indefinitely. Uh, perpetual energy, perpetual resources is kind of how we tend to see ourselves. And we're not. And, and that's not my opinion. That, that's factual. We are finite beings in every possible way. We have a limited amount of time in the day. We have a limited amount of energy. We have a limited period of time for which we will exist. We are, by definition, finite creatures. And when we do not recognize that and treat ourselves as that, we can get ourselves into trouble. A little more justification for my idea that the most important thing in your life is you, or at least the most impactful thing in your life is you. You are the only companion that you will have from the moment of your birth until the moment of your death. There's no one else that will be there for everything except you. Chances are no one else will be there for even half of that. Um, even if you have a relationship that lasts most of your life, you will have times when you're away from that person, probably at your career, for example. You're the only person that's there for everything. You have, they, it's interesting how they measured this and I won't get into it because it's honestly kind of, I realize it's contradictory to say it's interesting and then also say it's boring, but it is kind of both how they measured it. But most people have between 60 and 80,000 conscious thoughts a day. And we speak on average about 10 to 15,000 words a day. So just think about the discrepancy there. You vocalize maybe 10, 15, 20% at most probably of the thoughts that are actually in your head on any given day. So if you had a person who was with you every second of every day and did nothing but listen to you and pay attention to the things you said, that person, that extremely unrealistic person who does not exist, would know about 20% as much about you as you know about you. And the things that we keep inside, a lot of those things that we don't say, those are often some of the most important things. The secret stuff that we don't voice, sometimes is the stuff that we really do need somebody to know about. So no one is ever gonna know you the way you know you. Not your partner, not your kids, not your parents, not your best friend, not your therapist, not your doctor. No one will know you the way you know you. No one has the ability to show up for you the way you can show up for yourself. No one else has the ability to meet the needs that you won't even tell other people about. because They don't know about them. So you are your greatest asset and your greatest ally. Or at least I should say, you have the ability to be. You also have the ability to be terrible to yourself. Um, and many of us accidentally or, or not on purpose end up choosing that path. Yeah. 
that's the wrong button. What have I just done? I've zoomed instead of, okay. Any Breaking Bad fans? One, two, good, great, lots of you. Okay, excellent choice of metaphors there. Um, I guess I'm blocking him, but the character from the top right of the side is Mike from Breaking Bad. And Mike has a really famous speech that he gives in the show. It's, it's my favorite moment in the entire show. Um, Mike used to be a police officer. He was kind of a semi-corrupt vigilante type police officer, but he was. And later in life, when we meet him in the show, he's more of a, I guess, hitman. He's not a great person, but he has some interesting ideas on life. Um, so yes, I'm quoting a hitman in my speech about self-care. Don't read into that too much, please. His, his speech about half measures is probably my favorite thing that ever happens on the show. And when he was working as a police officer, he arrested somebody um, for domestic violence. And he had a, a really, really bad feeling about this person. And he mentions to, to Walter, the main character of the show, that he, he had a feeling that he should have just killed this person. And instead he took him into custody for about a day and let him go. And the person later went back and killed his partner. It's fictional obviously, but that does happen. And that day changed Mike's life. And from that day forward, he lived by the motto, no more half measures. Never do a job halfway, never go partway, give everything your all or you'll face some serious consequences. That is the approach that I try to take with my self-care. I approach my self-care with no half measures because I don't think there is anything that's more important than that. I don't think anything in your life, your career, your partner selection, your education, your house, what city you live in, I don't think any of those things will have even a fraction of the impact on the quality of your life as your relationship with yourself and the quality with which you care for yourself. I don't think it's possible to just consistently put yourself on the back burner or give yourself little, little things every now and then, you know, we, little vacations, little breaks, whatnot. I don't think that's what we need because life stressors, the challenges that we face, the kind of stuff that we do, that's not, those aren't half measures. Life does not come at us halfway. It doesn't give us half-hearted challenges and easy little victories to overcome. I mean, we get some of those, yeah, but there's a lot that goes beyond that. And if we don't have the same intensity in what we do to recover from that, to live with that, to deal with that, that's a losing battle. That's a system of diminishing returns where every day takes a little bit more from you than you can replace. And that will eventually lead to something catastrophic. It may be burnout, it may be isolation, it may be a mental health crisis, it may be a physical health crisis. It will end badly. That's not a sustainable system, it can't last forever. Sometimes people crash after two years of that, sometimes people crash after 30 years of that, but it doesn't work indefinitely. So I want everybody listening to this to think about where you put yourself in your ranking and whether that's something that you can sustain for the rest of your life. Because a lot of people say, you know, once things calm down, once things, once things get simpler at my job or once my kids are a little older, or once whatever other arbitrary benchmark you can think of, once that happens, once things get easier and simpler, then I'll take care of me. How long have you been waiting for that though? Long time, it, it doesn't ever happen. I mean, those specific things happen, but then other new challenges come up. Life never really gets measurably easier, at least in my experience. So if you're waiting for a convenient time when you're uh, experiencing a surplus of time and energy, I, I don't know that that moment's going to come. I think we can wait forever for those moments. And it's much easier to prevent a mental health crisis than it is to recover from one. Neither are easy. This is a matter of relativity. But as someone who regularly helps people do both, prevention is easier than recovery. There will never be a simple, easy, convenient time to change your habits and change your patterns and put yourself first. But that doesn't mean you can't do it.
So assuming that anything I've said has been of interest for you so far, you might be wondering, how do I actually do that? Sounds great, sounds interesting. What are the actual tangible action steps I can take to change my relationship with myself and take better care of myself and value myself more? Good news is that's my job, so I'll help you figure that out. I wanna tell a little story first, um, a story about love. It's actually a story about a person who loves cars, but I promise there's a point to it. I had a friend growing up who was, like I would say his family was, the word that comes to mind is hilariously wealthy. Like they had so much money, it was kind of funny. And this person, he's in his early 20s. And one day he's like, I'm gonna show, I wanna show you the garage. So he takes me down to the garage, which is about the size of this room, honestly, about the size of Halligan Education Center. And in the garage, there are six Ferraris in this garage. And I just, I don't even know what to think. I'm just dumbfounded by this whole thing. And I think for a couple of minutes, I just stood there and stared and didn't even know what to say. And I remember finally saying, which one is your favorite? And he, he thought about it for a second. Because I, I thought for sure it would be like, they had an F40, which costs like a million dollars. I think at that time, it was maybe the fastest car in the world, other than fastest like commercially available car anyway. And he thinks for a second and he says, follow me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding. Like, is there another, is there a garage under this with more cars in it? He takes me out to the driveway and in his driveway, because it didn't meet the criteria for the garage was a mid nineties Mazda RX-7, which if you don't, it, it's a nice car. It's not a Ferrari. It's a nice car. It's a good car. And he said, believe it or not, this is my favorite car. And I didn't get it. I, I had no, I could not wrap my head around that. That was kind of like the car I drove at the time. I'm like, you have those and this is your favorite. I did not understand. So I asked him a bunch of questions. I was trying to figure out how, how does this happen? How does this even make sense? And what he was able to explain to me basically was that the Ferraris kind of felt too expensive and too fancy and, and he drove them and he like, he loved them. They were awesome, but that's all. He, he would drive them and then put them away in the garage and, and they were just cars to him. That's all they were. The RX-7, because it was an older car, a less valuable car, not as complicated, he did his own work on this car. He modified it. He changed the oil, he touched up the paint. He felt like it was his. He felt a connection with this car. He felt a sense of ownership and investment in the car. And that's why it was his favorite car. It was not the fastest, it was not the most valuable, it was not the rarest, it was not the most attention getting. It was the one he had the greatest connection with. Because he invested his time and his energy and his thoughts and his feelings and his money, into this car, that's the one he loved the most. And that is how our brains work. We don't have a self-love switch that we can just turn on and say, okay, I'm all in, I'm ready, I love myself now, let's go, let's do this. We, there's no way to do that. The way that you can create feelings of value and affection and love and caring for yourself are the same way you try to earn them from another person. All the rules that apply to your relationships with other people, those same rules dictate your relationship with yourself. You can't neglect yourself and expect to feel like you care about yourself. Because if someone else neglected you, if you opened your heart constantly to another person and they did nothing with it, if you said, I'm nervous about this, and they didn't help you. If you said, I'm sad about this and they didn't listen to you. If you said, I'm angry and they brushed it aside, that's gonna be a hard person to love, right? That's not gonna be someone you feel a great connection with. That's not gonna be someone you want to spend time with or feel a lot of affection towards. And so if you want to have those feelings from yourself, you have to earn them the same way you would from someone else. So some of the ways that you can do that are take your feelings seriously. When you're having a hard day and you know you need something, maybe you need a break, maybe you need a cup of coffee, you need a day off, you need 10 minutes, whatever it is, when you identify, I need something, give it to yourself. Don't blow it off. Don't say, oh, maybe in an hour, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. Take your feelings seriously. Take your wants and needs seriously. Meet your own needs as consistently as you can. I understand it may not be 100% of the time, 
But there are so many moments in our days where we could do something to show up for ourselves and we don't, we skip right by it. And every time you do that, it makes a little wound, just like it would if someone else did. And it takes you further and further away from feeling like you are somebody you can trust, you can rely on, and you care about. And that's, that's taking you away from the only person who's ever going to really get it. And that's not good. Listen to yourself. Like, really listen to yourself. Don't listen to yourself while you're distracted. Don't, don't have your most private, important thoughts while you're also watching TV. Like, really give yourself uninterrupted, undivided, devoted time, even if it's only a few minutes a day. But if you neglect yourself, you are not going to feel the way about yourself that you want to. So you can't force yourself to love yourself, but you can create those feelings of love through treating yourself the way you want to be treated by others. That's the starting point. Some of those actions that you identify like you want or you need might be things that are very outside of your norm, your routine, your comfort zone. And that brings us to motivation. So that's something I hear a lot is, I just don't feel motivated to do this. I know I should take breaks, but I don't feel motivated. I know I should take walks, but I, I just don't, I don't feel like I wanna do it. I know I should, but there's no, there's no drive, there's no desire to do it other than just like guilt or expectations. I have, this, this is technically not something I've researched, so I can't claim that this is an empirically validated strategy, but this tracks with my own life. And this is something I've been working using in my work with almost all of my therapy clients and it's working pretty much 100% of the time. My theory of motivation, whether we do or do not do something, is that it's simply a matter of our perception of effort versus our perception of reward. Because if you think about, you all do hard things. I know you all do hard things. And I, I'm betting that there are also some relatively easy things that you all maybe struggle to do consistently. Like you can all go to work, do what you do at work, which is objectively challenging, but maybe you go home and you can't get your laundry done. And that doesn't seem like it makes any sense. Like, why can I do this thing that I know not a lot of people can do, but this normal daily task I struggle with. And I think it has to do with a combination of our perception of the effort of the task and our perception of the reward for the task. When something doesn't feel rewarding, when you don't feel like there's anything in it for you, no value, no, no positive outcome, it doesn't matter if that thing's simple. It doesn't matter if that thing takes but five minutes to do. It doesn't feel worth it. It doesn't feel like a good deal. Now, on the flip side, something that's extremely challenging, but you know is going to create incredible feelings of pride and accomplishment and self-worth, you can probably do that thing over and over and over again, even if it's very difficult because you get more than what you put into it. So that's my theory as to why sometimes we do very, very difficult things but struggle with what seems like easier, simpler things. The good news is both of those variables, perception of effort and perception of reward, to some degree can be manipulated. And if we can swap them around so that we feel that the things we really want or need to do in a day are more rewarding than the effort we have to put in to accomplish them, then those are things you'll naturally want to do again and again and again. So here are some ways you can do this. The first is increase reward. We are, at least in North America, I haven't been outside of North America, but in this culture, at least, we are incredibly good at stealing reward from ourselves. We do things and then we just move on. I, I know so many people who do so many amazing things every day and, and are, are hesitant or afraid even to like give themselves even the slightest bit of credit for the things they do. And we self-deprecate and we deflect and we minimize. And we say, oh, it's not a big deal. That's just my job. I'm just a parent. I'm just a partner. I'm just a whatever. That's, that's just what I do. And it's like we refuse to let it in and let it be a big deal. But everything you do is a big deal. Every person you interact with, everybody you help, everything you do for yourself, everything you do to make your house look better, your car look better, those are all big deals. And they can create feelings of reward if you'll allow them to. But it's just do it on to the next, do it on to the next. That's, it's so easy to get into that habit and that drains us. That's one of those 
unsustainable patterns that I was talking about that cannot keep going forever. You can increase the rewards you feel by just taking a few moments after you do something, either right after or maybe at the end of your day, and just think about it a little bit. That's what got me through a period of probably near burnout professionally. All it was, this stuff can be so simple, is every night before I went to go to bed, I spent maybe five minutes just thinking about a few therapy sessions I had that day, and thinking about what it was probably like for the other person. Kind of like a little highlight reel, like my own little sports center of my day. It sounds like nothing or next to nothing. It, it changed everything for me. That got me out of a period of burnout and into a period of higher productivity again. Just give myself five minutes. That is all I needed of actual credit for the seven, eight, nine hours of therapy a day I was doing. Usually it's such, we usually just need a little bit. We're so hesitant to give it to ourselves and the world doesn't always give it to us. The world and your job, other people, they'll, they'll see the big moments, they'll see the big things. And, and you know they'll probably congratulate you for that or make you feel good about that. But what about all the things you do that no one can see? Because so much of what we do is internal. No one sees you work through your anxiety because it's not physically obvious to other people. No one sees you get out of bed on a day when you're depressed because they might probably don't even know you feel that way. So much of the most incredible things that you do cannot be witnessed by anyone other than you because there's nothing for others to see externally. So the only person capable of reinforcing those, of rewarding those, of appreciating those is you. And if you miss them, that's it. That was your only shot to feel good about that. Look for the little things, every little thing you do each day. In fact, I have an, I have an example of this that I did last night. I was, I fell asleep thinking about what I wanted to say today, and I woke up at 2.30 and had a hard time going back to sleep, because I was a mix of nervous and excited, and for a little bit, I considered just staying awake, and I remember, you know, last time this happened, I remember switching beds helped me a lot, so I went downstairs, laid down on the couch, and within 10 minutes, I'd fallen asleep, and I got close to a full night's sleep. I woke up rewarding myself for that. I feel like I had a victory today that no one else but me, well, now people know about it because I just told that story, but until now, no one knew about that. And therefore no one could say, oh, that's awesome, good job. Like, I'm glad that you didn't just let yourself try to function on four hours of sleep today on a big day for you. That probably wouldn't have been great. No one but me even had the opportunity to congratulate me for that. It was only me, and so I did. I woke up and I said, you know what? Good job. You." You've already conquered your first challenge of today. That's a good start. You keep doing that, you're going to have a good day today. Just little stuff like that. On the flip side, you can also sometimes decrease. Now, keep in mind, it's perception of effort. You, there are a lot of ways that you can decrease the perception of effort for things. I am pretty sure, again, have not studied this, but I'm pretty sure that there is a fairly strong correlation between perfectionism and people who work in the medical community. To some extent, that might be a good thing, but if you expand those expectations to your personal life and also expect everything about your house and your day and your schedule and your body and whatever else to follow those same levels of perfection, you have now created a scenario where the perception of effort to do whatever you need to do is very high. So if you're thinking about cleaning your house, for example, and you're a perfectionist and you say, well, it has to be immaculate. Every room has to be spotless and everything has to be organized. And then you think about it for like 10 minutes and it's like, well, that seems too hard. And then you end up not doing any of it because the perception of the effort was higher than the reward you thought you were going to get from it. And it didn't feel worth it. Nothing happened. So if you decreased your perception of the effort it would take, by lowering your expectations for yourself, I think paradoxically, you'd probably get a lot more done. And I say, I think, but actually I shouldn't say, I think, because that one I do know. Um, I didn't make a slide on this, but there's a concept called the yerkes dodson stress law. It's a measure of the relationship between pressure and performance. And it's a bell curve. 
meaning we need a moderate amount of pressure to do our best work. Like, yeah, if you don't care at all, if you don't think something's important, if you're not passionate about it, yeah, you're not gonna do your best work. That is true. So you do need a certain amount of pressure, but there's a point where that pressure becomes counterproductive and actually becomes a bottleneck that shuts you down because everything feels black and white, life or death all the time. And you feel like you can't even start because if you don't do it just right, there's no point in doing it at all. Another way that you can decrease effort is to set limits. Rather than saying, you know, today I will clean my house and like it has to be done and making this black and white scenario. What if you said, I'm going to spend 20 minutes on housework today. And if you do that every day, you'll probably get everything done that you want eventually. But you decrease your perception of effort by creating a limit. And that actually makes you more able to initiate the behavior. And if you go over the 20 minutes, okay, maybe you'll do more. Lastly, think about removing barriers to the things you want to do more. I work with so many people who say like, yeah, I, have, I have all these great coping skills. Like I love, I love to do art or I love to knit. And I'll say, okay, where's your stuff? Where's your, where's your art supplies? Where's your knitting supplies? Like, oh, they're in the bottom of the storage closet. So that's going to take a lot of work to get that stuff out and use it, right? And if you're in the middle of a depressive episode or a panic attack, you're telling me you're going to reorganize your closet to get your art supplies? I think we need to make them a little more accessible than that. Think about your environment, your home, your work environment, the structure of your day, whatever it is that you want to do more of, make sure you can get to it. Make sure it's easily accessible. Make sure there aren't seven other action steps you have to complete before you can do it or start it or, or reach it. Because the more barriers there are in place between you and the things you wanna do, the more likely you are to just say, nah, it's not, it's not worth it. Too much effort, too much work. Not today, maybe tomorrow. And then you say that the next day too, and that's just how it goes until you take some of those barriers away. So in the, in the name of trying to work on sustainability, I wanna talk about two different kinds of resources that we use to deal with our emotional distress. So broadly speaking, I define a resource as anything that for a period of time decreases the emotional distress that you feel. Any kind of emotional distress, anger, fear, sadness, whatever it may be, anything that makes you for a little bit of time feel better is a resource. There are two different types of resources that we can use to deal with our emotions and they function very differently. Crisis resources are the things that we are more likely to turn to, as the name implies, during times of crisis. And they are resources that are pretty fast acting and very powerful. They make us feel a lot better in a short amount of time. I have given a few examples here. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it will kind of give you a sense of the types of things we're talking about. Uh, abuse of drugs or alcohol, disordered eating habits, whether that's restricting, binging, purging. Workaholism can be a big one. Uh, avoiding your personal life or your home life to just stay at work and work more. Avoidance or isolating, almost any kind of impulsive behavior, gambling, uh, shopping, impulsive sexual behaviors. These are all things that give us like this big momentary release, right? But it's also pretty short lived. And usually once the relief from the use of a crisis resource wears off, we actually feel a little bit worse than when we started, assuming we don't use it again, which is the pattern we often fall into. Because all of these things, because they're so powerful, they have costs associated with using them. Some of those are, are health costs, physical or mental. Like some of these things are, are not great for our bodies and our brains. Um, some have social costs. These can affect our relationships. These can affect people's ability to trust us. Uh, these can make people mad at us. Some of these have high or, or financial costs. Like some of these are just expensive, like impulsive shopping is, is an expensive resource. Um, and so it's, it's very understandable why we're in a, when we're in a crisis state, we feel like we need to use these things. But long-term use of, of crisis resources is another unsustainable pattern. Because even if whatever was initially going on in your life that got you to that point of crisis resolves or takes care of itself, these resources create crises in your life. 
They create relational crises, they create health crises, they create financial crises, which you then have to use crisis resources to deal with. So they become a self-perpetuating pattern that is extremely difficult to get out of. I, I recently moved to Marion, so I'm suddenly very aware of like how roundabouts work. And <laughs> this always makes me think it's, it's basically a roundabout that doesn't have an exit, you just keep driving in circles. Sustainable resources in comparison are not as powerful on a one-to-one -one basis. They're not even really all that close probably. And in many cases, they don't work as quickly either. So this is gonna be a, a slower and smaller decline in our emotional distress on a one-to-one -one basis when compared with crisis resources. But sustainable resources typically have little or no cost associated with them. In other words, you can do these things again and again and again, and it's unlikely to cause any real problems in your life. You'll see I put an asterisk there because uh, this is, there's no concrete differentiation between crisis resources and sustainable resources. Any sustainable resource can function like a crisis resource if we use it in kind of an addictive manner. So like a really good example of that is exercise. Exercise is generally thought of as a health positive behavior, right? It's good for our bodies, it's good for our brains, it makes us more resilient to stress, helps us sleep better, helps us with our appetite. But exercise addiction is a very real thing. There are people that use exercise the way some people use drugs or alcohol. They will work out despite illness or injury. They will blow off social opportunities or, or other engagements to work out. It's their one and only coping skill. And anything being used in that manner is going to end up functioning more like a crisis resource for you. So it's, it's not obvious what one is or isn't just by the activity. It's more about how you use it. When we can use sustainable resources to deal with our emotional distress, it gets you off that roundabout because you aren't unintentionally creating additional problems or additional crises that you then need to use strong, intense resources to deal with. But where people get caught up in this a lot is trying to make this a one-to-one -one trade. In other words, say I have a problem with alcohol. I'm using alcohol too much to cope with my stress. And I think, well, instead of drinking, I will meditate. Meditation would probably be a sustainable resource. It's a nice idea in theory, but those are not equally powerful resources. The, the difference in the amount of distress relief I would get, at least me, because I'm not like a pro meditator, from alcohol compared to meditation, those are not even in the same ballpark for how much of an effect they would have on me. So there's a couple strategies that I wanna teach you about that can even the playing field a little bit. And they're called stacking and chaining, two different ways of accomplishing the same thing. To stack sustainable resources means you're finding some type of single cohesive activity that uses several of your sustainable pre, uh, resources at once. To give an example, I'm in a basketball league and that combines several sustainable resources for me in one single activity. I like basketball, so that's a hobby of mine, so it's fun. It's physical exercise. It gets me out of the house. It gets me with friends. I get social support. There are people I know. So there's four or five different really powerful coping skills for me in this one single cohesive activity that I do. So that's a very powerful activity for me. And that's going to approach, it's still not going to be quite the same, but it's going to at least be closer. It's going to be more in the vicinity of the power of a crisis resource. Stacking is the fastest way to, to apply your sustainable resources. The trouble is it's often not something you can do on a whim. Like, I've had a really bad day at work. It may not be feasible for me to call 10 friends and be like, guys, got to play basketball tonight because work was tough today. I can, I can try. It might happen, but it's probably a long shot, right? It's not necessarily something I can just assume is going to work. So chaining is your other strategy here. And chaining just means you use several creative resources consecutively. You're kind of paying attention, staying mindful, staying in touch with your inner experience 
trying to identify the point when you've gotten everything that you're going to get from something. Because with every resource, you'll reach a point where it's just not going to do much more for you. Like meditation is a good example. Um, unless meditation is a huge part of your daily practice, you meditate for maybe five, 10 minutes, you feel some certain amount better, right? If you keep that going for two hours, it's not going to keep making you feel better. At some point, you're going to get to the point where you have meditated enough that you're just done with that thing. When that happens, you switch to something else and you just keep that going. Maybe you meditate, then you do some deep breathing, then you go work out, then you call a friend, and then you spend some time on a hobby. And at the end of all that, your distress level has gone down quite a bit, maybe pretty close to the level that it would be had you used a crisis resource, but it's not going to shoot back up. I mean, it could if something else, both of these scenarios assume nothing else happens in your day. Obviously, it's not realistic, but in a vacuum, it doesn't go back up because you have not done anything that you're going to beat yourself up about. You haven't done anything you're going to regret. You haven't done anything that's going to hurt you or make people mad at you. So if you use these strategies of stacking and chaining, you can somewhat level that playing field and get close to the level of emotional relief that you get from your crisis resources by using things that don't blow back on you. Another thing, and this, is, this was gonna be part of the presentation anyway, I think this is especially important now, given some of the events that have happened in the last couple of weeks, a huge part of keeping your sanity, keeping your relationship with yourself intact and not burning yourself out is applying your psychosocial boundaries. I know that boundaries usually makes us think of like our physical space, your bubble, how close you let people sit to you, all that kind of stuff. But your boundaries are so much more than that. You also have mental and emotional boundaries and they function with the same rules as your living space. So you all, you all have a living space, a room, apartment, a condo, a home, wherever you live, that is your space, right? And you are responsible for the contents of that space. No one else, just you. You're not responsible for anyone else's space. If you have a friend who really struggles with clutter or you just think their decor is really ugly, that's not your problem. It's not appropriate for you to go into their home and rearrange it because you think it needs to be better. You're only responsible for your own stuff. And that is also true for everyone else and their own space. That's also true for our, our mental health, our mental space. Your values, your beliefs, your experiences, your memories, your thoughts, all of these things belong to you. They are your property. And no one else has the right to force you to change them. You can listen to other people. You can hear other perspectives without being obligated to override your own beliefs. You get to control what is inside your boundary. And if someone says something to you that's hurtful or invalidating or unfair, you don't have to take that in. You don't have to allow that into your boundary. You don't have to take possession of that belief or of that statement. You can just leave it in the empty space between the two of you and say, no, thanks, that's not mine. You don't have to say that to the person. It can be a completely secretive process. Sometimes it's better if it is. That's another thing that's often misunderstood about boundaries is, People think boundaries are something you have to communicate to other people. Like people have to know that you have the boundary with them. I have boundaries with every single person in my life that they do not know about. Secret boundaries, every single one of them. Certain topics where if this topic comes up, I, I'm just not interested in what this person has to say and I'll smile and nod, but I will take nothing in. I don't have to tell them that. I don't have to list all the reasons why I think they're wrong. I may not be in the mood for that kind of conversation. I might not have the energy for that argument. I'm not obligated to take it in just because I'm not willing to argue. The metaphor that I like to think of is when you're driving around, sometimes you see free furniture on the curb, right? You don't have to take it. Someone's offering it. Someone's saying, hey, would you, would you like this couch? And maybe it's stained and cigarette burned and not great looking. You don't have to take it. Just because someone offers something to you does not obligate you to take it from them. And that's not just true of, of physical items. People will offer you feelings and perspectives and ideas and values, and you don't have to take any of it. 
you can, and, and it's probably good to at least consider it because we can all learn from one another, but you don't have to take anything in that you don't feel like belongs in your space. So I, I literally use this metaphor in my life. I, I physically visualize my boundary and I see words coming up to the edge of it. And I look at the words and I think, do I want that in my space? Sometimes I do. And then I take it in. I say, that's valuable. I, need, I needed to hear that today. I need that perspective. I need that information. Other times I look at it and say, I don't think that's for me. That's, that's like someone has come to my house and, and has held up a, a, a really like unfortunate looking clown painting and said, would you like this? And, no, I, no, thank you. You can, you can take that one to goodwill. I don't need that. I know that, and I get it, I'm in the helping profession. I'm, I'm a therapist, I'm a spouse, I'm a parent, I'm a special needs parent. I, I get the pressure to help everyone and fix everyone and save everyone, but it comes back to you. And if you don't take care of you first, you can't do those things, not forever. So don't take more into your boundary than you are able to deal with at that point in time. I also want to talk a little bit about energy budgeting, and this is a very related concept to boundaries. And it kind of goes back to the idea um, that I started with that we are not infinite beings with infinite resources. Just as you should have a budget for your money, you should also have a budget for your energy. And I know it's a little harder because it, it's harder to track. You don't have a spreadsheet showing your energy and balance showing you where everything's going. So this is a little more uh, subjective, but your energy is finite on any given day, just like your money is. You only have so much of it and you will run out at some point. And if you aren't making conscious, mindful decisions about where you're spending that energy, it's gonna get spent, but maybe not on the things that you want it to. Maybe it all gets spent by 4 p.m. every day. And by the time you get home and you really want to spend time and enjoy time with your family or make a nice meal for yourself or go to the gym or whatever it is, you just find yourself not doing that over and over and over again because it just doesn't feel like there's anything left to give. You've spent all your energy. You're in a deficit. And when you're in a deficit state, you're not going to have anything else to give until you recover. There's no super detailed trick that I know with this one. I don't, I don't know of a system to use in your brain to, to track your energy and, and to make sure that you don't run out. I just wanna introduce it as a concept. I wanna remind everybody that you do not have infinite energy. And if you treat yourself like you do, if you don't recognize that truth, it will get spent possibly on things that are not your top priorities in life. It'll get spent just based on the order in which things happen rather than what matters most to you. You probably won't end up real happy with how things are going. I also want to talk about the difference between physical and mental energy because they play by different rules. We can be physically exhausted, we can be mentally exhausted, or we can be both at times. I'm betting that for most of us, probably not all of us, but most of us probably have lifestyles that are more mentally or emotionally demanding than they are physically demanding. But where this gets really tricky is that physical and mental exhaustion feel the same. There, there's no tangible difference in the experience of one versus the other. And a vicious cycle that I see people get stuck in a lot is people get mentally or emotionally exhausted and try to recover from it physically. In other words, you get home from a day of work, you're drained, you're wiped out, you don't feel like you have much to give. What you really feel like you wanna do is just lay on the couch and watch TV or something like that. You wanna rest, you wanna relax, you wanna take it easy. That will work, maybe you even just wanna sleep. That works if you are physically exhausted. And if you have a physically challenging job, that may indeed be what you need. If you can identify I think my job probably is taking more out of me mentally than physically. That's not what you need in that moment. In fact, you may notice that that actually makes it worse because when we have been stressed and mentally drained all day, what recharges us from that 
is something that is stimulating but low stress. In other words, our brains need a break from thinking about the stressors. And physically resting, having downtime, having relaxing time, does not give your brain a break from thinking about the stressors. In fact, it gives you less going on in your life to distract you from the stressors. That's why sometimes you might notice the most stressful time of your whole day is right when you start trying to go to bed, right when you lay down and try to fall asleep. Because for some of us, that might be the first time in our entire day when we haven't been distracted with other things. That's the first time when you're unstimulated by your day and everything hits you all at once. So if you are in a pattern of mental exhaustion, I know this will go against what you feel like you want to do near the end of your day. But think of things that are really mentally engaging to you. Things that take a lot of your brain, things that really interest you, things that when you engage in them, you notice you don't think about other stuff very much. But you also want to make sure that they are low stress things. In other words, something that you're not super concerned about the outcome of. If you are an artist and you're trying to like make a side hustle selling your paintings on Etsy, that's probably not low stress because you, you have a financial investment in making sure that your work looks good. And so if you don't do a great job, you're gonna be upset with yourself. So not things like that, things that don't really matter to you. Like one for me, this is a very subjective thing because we're all different people with different brains, but one that works really well for me is woodworking because I do think it's fun, but I'm not good at it. And I know that I'm not good at it and I don't ever expect to be good at it. And I know that everything I make is probably gonna end up in the fire pit and that's totally okay. So then if I mess up, I don't care. I expected that. I just like using power tools, it's fun. It's, it's don't read into that. It's intellectually stimulating for me. Or, or some people like video games or Sudoku or whatever it may be. Anything that you know that you kind of lose yourself in it a little bit when you do it, but that you don't get super worried about, those are your recovery tools for mental exhaustion. So try to kind of be aware Looking back on your day, when you feel that exhaustion, ask yourself, is it more likely that this is physical exhaustion or mental exhaustion? And meet yourself where you're at, depending on what your answer is. So that is the end of the standardized things I had planned to say to you. Um, if some of this was of interest to you and you're wondering what some next steps might be to help you kind of continue following through on some of these ideas, EAP counseling obviously is an option. Um, I also just wanna remind people that EAP is a wonderful program, but most of us probably also have insurance and you aren't limited to using EAP benefits for individual therapy. Insurance also covers it and you can also see a therapist through your insurance. Um, I heard this book is good, so that might also be all right. I had to promote it a little. I am terrible at self-promotion. That's. That's as much as I'll do. Any more than that is terribly awkward for me. Um, so I guess this would now be the question and answer portion. I see there's a few things in the chat. Let me see if these are questions. When will this recording be shared? I don't know. Do you know? Okay. Okay, so we are going to convert this into a YouTube video link and we will plan to share that hopefully by the end of this week. Thank you very much, wonderful presentation. Not a question, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Questions in the room? Yes, Susie. What do I do when someone raises their hand in the chat? Because that just happened. I don't know what to do. What does that mean? Lori Gustafson has raised her hand, is what it said. Okay. If you could uh, type your question, Lori, because I don't know what to do otherwise. <laughs> I see that you've raised your hand, but I don't know how to call on you, so. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, given that no person is an island, do you have any tips or insight to how we individually uh, reconcile or negotiate our own needs to take care of ourselves 
and with those of others? That is a great question. And I had meant to say more about that in my presentation and I got too excited about other things and I didn't say it. So I'm really glad you asked that. I know that that's what a lot of people fear. Like, well, if I spend more time and more energy on myself, won't I have less to give to other people? Because I also have these other people in my life who want me and need me, who I enjoy being there for. Every single time that I've done this or that I've seen someone else do this, this being increase the emphasis on yourself, it has the opposite effect. It gives you more energy. It gives you more time. It gives you more space because you are meeting your own needs more regularly. And that reduces a lot of downtime in your day. This is how I live. And this was a big turning point for me. I practice what I preach. This isn't just like theoretical stuff I think people should do. And then I go home and neglect it. But I haven't always lived this way. And honestly, it was a big turning point for me, both in my career and in my home life. I got better at everything when I focused less on those things and more on me. I had more energy. I had more motivation. I had more emotional stability. I had a better foundation. And that, that's really what it comes down to for me is your relationship with yourself is your foundation. It's not the most glamorous part. It's not the most exciting part, but it is the most essential part for everything else that gets built on it. If you build a beautiful beachside mansion and you don't spend enough time on the foundation, what's going to happen to it? Eventually it's going to collapse. And that can happen to our lives. The more we add on, the more people we're involved with, the more responsibilities we have, the more we do professionally, the more strain is on that foundation. And that foundation is how you treat yourself. So I, I, I get the concern and I know that's, that's what a lot of people say. Well, how am I gonna do that? I have all this other stuff too. That's why you need to do it. It will make all those things better. Um, Whoops, I missed something. What are some less awkward ways to convey the need for time and space for self-care to others, both at work and at home? That's a great question. To some extent, I'm sure that depends on the people in your life and what your relationships with them are like and their personality types. But very broadly speaking, I would say directly and assertively as simply and, and as basically as possible. When we, um, when we communicate our needs in kind of a roundabout way and build in a lot of qualifiers and outs, like, you know, I know you're really busy too, and, and I know we all have a lot going on and it's okay if you don't have time, but, and then somewhere in there, there's a request buried among all the qualifiers. What often happens is people really want to be there for us and they actually don't even know what we're asking of them because there was so much in that that they don't know what we need. I would be as direct and assertive with people as possible and let them know it's not just for me. This is also for you. I want to continue to be able to be there for you. I want to be a good employee or manager or spouse or parent. And in order to do that, here's what I need right now. That's what I think gets missed in this a lot is it's, it's not a selfish act. In fact, I actually think that caring for yourself is a selfless act. I know that sounds weird, but if anyone has ever seen a loved one who's clearly on a downward spiral and who needs some help but isn't accessing it and isn't giving it to themselves, there are not very many things that feel as bad as that. And if you can take care of yourself and never be that person for somebody else, don't, don't overlook how valuable that is. To be something in people's lives that they don't ever have to worry about is not selfish. And if you take excellent care of yourself, that's what can happen. On the flip side, I actually think, controversial I know, that chronically neglecting yourself is actually kind of selfish. Because anyone who loves you and cares about you and values you, they want you to be okay. Their emotional health is related to yours. And if you're not okay and you refuse to take care of yourself because you keep prioritizing everything else, that negatively affects people who care about you. They see it. 
Even if you hide it, they, they see it, trust me. I talk to them in therapy, they see it. And they're worried about you and they want you to take care of yourself. They would feel better if you did. There may still be some resistance at first because anytime we change a pattern, people will always have a like kind of a weird reaction to it at first. Like, what, what is this? What's happening? I don't know if I like this. We fear change. We're mammals. We like to survive. But once you get past that awkward initial period, it'll be better for everyone, not just you. It's, it's, it's a kind act to others to care for yourself. At least that's what I believe. I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Are there any other questions in the room? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question is when, when you're in a state of chronic stress for a, a, like in that crisis period for a long period of time, um, whether from events that are, that are happening or things that are transpiring over and over and over and over again, and you kind of can't seem to, to catch up. Um, what do you do at that point? And then to kind of piggyback off of that, when you're in the situation where the things that you were doing to stack and chain are no longer working for you because you're getting to a point where like you're doing all of, you feel like you're doing everything, but then nothing's working. Well, one thing I would say right away is, are, are these all, and this is kind of a theoretical answer, but are these all things you're trying to do on your own? Because if you're in that type of state and it has been that way for a long time, that's a great time to ask for help. Personally, professionally, both maybe. Um, so not trying to do it all by yourself would be one thing I would recommend. Um, Another thing that happens with sustainable resources is part of that mental stimulation that distracts you from the distress involves novelty. And so it, it, it's, it's actually very true that if you kind of use the same set of resources over and over and over again, you will often find that they decrease in effectiveness over time. Like let's say that, you, let's say that one of your sustainable resources is like reading fantasy novels, for example, which is great. But as someone who also reads fantasy novels, they're all kind of similar. And you, if you read enough of them, you sort of get to the point where you're like, I know what's going to happen in this book, even though I've never read it, because they've clearly been influenced by seven other books that I've read. And at that point, it becomes less stimulating because you don't have to stay engaged or think about it really hard to follow the plot or like watching the same movie or the same type of movie over and over again, playing the same types of games over and over again, your brain will start to automate the steps involved and therefore it's less stimulant. You don't have to work as hard at it and it will actually then become less effective as a coping resource. It's just like driving to work. If you drive the same route to work every day, you don't have to think about it at all. And that's, that's kind of a mixed blessing because then you start thinking about all your stressors on the way to work because you don't have to focus on your drive. So switching things up can also help quite a bit. Novelty is really important to our brains. One last thing I would say about that is this doesn't always have to be a super dramatic lifestyle change. I think that's part of what like gets people sometimes is they think, oh, to, to focus more on me, I'm going to have to like totally change my schedule and my home routine and my work schedule. Not necessarily. A lot of this is more just about mindset. It's more just about staying in tune with yourself, listening to yourself, making little choices throughout your day that help support your mental health. It can be subtle. If you like watched me for a day, if you just shadowed me for a day, there's nothing like super unusual that I do that would stand out to you as, oh, he's, he's doing that for his mental health right now. It, it would look normal. It would look like a pretty normal day. But it's little subtle details, like the podcasts that I listen to, for example, are very specifically chosen as things that I know are good for me and that help my mental health. Books that I read, the music that I listen to, it, it's the art on my walls, the background on my phone, all these little details. I make sure that these are all things that help me. Sometimes it's just all that stuff adds up. All the little things you do in your day, 
the food you eat, the water you drink, they all have a cumulative effect. Sometimes it's just shifting those things around a little bit in a way that is more supportive of your mental health. Do a few of those, you might see a big impact. I know we're just a couple minutes over here, but we have another question in the chat. And then how about one more question in the room? We'll reserve it for, so go ahead, Scott. All right, you discussed boundaries. How do we deal with it when a moral responsibility figuratively drops the crappy couch at your doorstep? It's really hard for me to answer that question as it's still being a metaphor. <laughs> Oh, let me think about that one for a second. Moral responsibility. I mean, there, there are things that you will have to attend to in your life. There are things that are going to be unavoidably placed into your boundaries. I, I get that. I'm not saying that you can just put this wall up and not care about anything that bothers you. I know that's not real. But there's still levels to which you can do that. And all of us, I guarantee every single person in this room right now is burdened by at least one thing that they can't do anything about, something that does not belong to them. And those are the things that get us. There will be unavoidable things. There will. But a lot of what we let into our boundaries doesn't belong to us and is avoidable. So that's where it kind of is a matter of budgeting. It's kind of like financially budgeting. It's like, you know, how do you plan for a crisis? Well, you, by knowing that they'll happen. That's all you can really do. You don't know how much your next unexpected car repair is going to cost. You can't have that exact amount set aside, but you can expect that something will happen that you need to be prepared for. You just don't know what it's going to be or how much it will cost you. Um, there was one more question in the chat. How can you manage major daily fatigue? Well, see, that depends on how much of it is physical or mental. Um, if it is physical, then you wanna look at things like sleep hygiene, um, nutrition, like make sure you're eating three meals and a couple snacks a day. Make sure you're sleeping at about the same time every night if you're able to. Um, stay hydrated, spend time on restful downtime activities. If it's more mental or psychological fatigue, then it comes back to those high stimulation, low stress novel activities that give your brain a break from the constant stress that most of our days can so easily get filled up by. That's the short answer. Thanks. All of these questions realistically require several hours to answer. So <laughs> and if you have other questions too for Scott, um, you're welcome to submit those to me. I'll be happy to compile them and have him respond. Any other questions in the room? I'll reserve it for one more question in the room. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Eilers. This was wonderful. Thank you.